this this uh, morning we have a, a really wonderful topic. Uh, I, I know every topic we every week we say that, but <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this week. And we have rightfully so been spending the first part of the semester uh, developing the preparation of Paul, his call, uh, his initial calling, his background, the vision he saw, the commission he had, all of uh, which was necessary because, as we pointed out a few weeks ago, God's way of working is to gain the right vessel, to gain the right person. And when he has that person, then he is able to work. And this week now, we actually get to the commencement of Paul's labor. And if you've been waiting for this, when are we going to touch his, his, his travels, his, his journeying? We're on the cusp of it now, but this week we see how it begins, and I think it will blow some concepts that we may have. So the focus, we don't have a lot of verses this week actually, the focus will really be these four verses in Acts chapter 13, which we will spend our time on. Let's read it all together right now. This will, this will be what we will labor on uh, for the next... 20 minutes or so. Ready? Go. Now there were in Antioch, in the local church, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius the Cyrene, and Menaean, the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me now. Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They then, having been sent out by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed away to Cyprus. Let me ask this question. If you were there in the early stages of the founding of the Christian church, and God wanted to do something particular, from where would God commence that? From what church? Who knows what the first, first church in the uh, New Testament is? Right, let's start with that, Ella. The church in? Jerusalem. 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 And you would think Jerusalem is, is where it's at, right? <laughs> that's where Peter is. That's where James is. That's where Pentecost happened. Oh, so much activity. For sure, Jerusalem is uh, the focus of where God will begin his activity. Okay, as you can see in this verses, there's nothing here in Jerusalem. It's actually Antioch. And this is the first point I want to impress you with, Antioch. Okay, I'm going to do a quick um, map. Not to scale. Um, but this is the Mediterranean Sea, okay? And um, this area here is Turkey, modern-day Turkey. Um, this is what? This is the geography majors. Mm -hmm. Modern-day Syria, um, Lebanon, and what's down here? Israel, okay? And we're actually going to touch a number of these places. Right here, there's an island called Cyprus. Okay. Maybe no geography majors. <laughs> <laughs> what countries right here? Egypt. Good. How much right here? Oh, excellent. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> so, again, not to scale, but Jerusalem is right around here. Okay. And that's, you know, that's, that's, again, that's, that's where it's happening. That's where all the big guns are. Um, you think that's the center. But, but, but here we have Antioch. And Antioch is actually right here. Actually, maybe a little bit north. Um, kind of on the border of Syria and Turkey. 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It's, 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 it's far away. And... Antioch be be becomes actually the center for a new start, a purified start, a 
of the Lord's move. How, how did believers get from Jerusalem to Antioch? Let's go to the next paragraph of verses. The background here is, remember uh, earlier in the semester we had a message on Stephen, who was, uh, who was stoned. And there is a great persecution led by who? Really, Paul, right? Saul. Which caused a dispersion of the believers who were in Jerusalem. And this word in the New Testament is dispersion, like scattering a seed. So the believers started scattering spreading all around the Mediterranean area. And that's the background for Acts 11, 19 through 21. Let's read that all together. Ready? Go. Those men who were scattered by the tribulation, which took place on account of Stephen, passed through as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews only. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and spoke also to the Greeks, announcing the Lord Jesus as the gospel. Amen. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Amen. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Amen. So there's this scattering, this persecution, and they're spread out. And you think, well, actually, this is, this is God's sovereignty, allowing the believers to scatter so that they would preach the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. But one big problem. They were scattered. Did you notice this little thing here? It says in the second line, speaking the word to no one except Jews only. <laughs> so they were believers, but they still had this Jewish tradition that uh, they couldn't shake. And actually, we'll get into this later, but the church in Jerusalem has a heavy, heavy religious baggage. They're still meeting in temples. They're often keeping the law. And so now the believers are scattered, but they still can't shake it. And they're going around to all these new areas, and they're only speaking to Jews. Now, I don't know in this room, there's, you know, a good, again, a good number. I don't know if any of us are Jewish by background. Maybe, maybe a few. But how would you feel? It would only be a couple of you in here. We'd all be, you know, if you only speak to the Jews, and all, many of us, the Gentiles, We'd be, uh, certainly a guy who looks like me. <laughs> you know, those believers, they'd come and they'd see me and they'd walk right by me. <laughs> Forget that guy. Okay, so, so th th there's a problem here. There's a problem. But, I'm happy to say, but, mm -hmm. there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which is actually here in northern Africa by Libya, who came to Antioch and they spoke also to the Greeks and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So something is happening now, a new start. Uh, people are breaking through their concepts, breaking out of the uh, influence of Jerusalem with all of its baggage. And now they're going, and they're speaking to people who look different, who don't have that background, and they're announcing Jesus as the gospel. And then you look at the next paragraph. The account concerning them was heard in the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. So now Jerusalem said, oh, what's going on? We, we heard something, right? Well, you know. But, you know, they sent out Barnabas to pass through as far as Antioch. You know, Barnabas was there, like, uh, to investigate, right? You know, what's going on here? This gospel is going out to the Gentiles. Seems like it's good, but we want to check it out. So Barnabas... He went there, and you can follow along. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, rejoiced and encouraged them all to remain with the Lord with purpose of heart. And he went forth to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And let's read this last sentence all together, starting with, and it happened. And it happened with them that for a whole year they were gathered in the church and taught a considerable number, and that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So do you see this new start here? Something marvelous is going on. Barnabas travels there, and he says, I need to get Saul to come and you know, be my companion, and we'll see what the Lord is doing. And they rejoiced. They were so happy. And they were there for at least a year, 
And it was there that the disciples were first called Christians. Actually, when the believers were here, with Peter, with James, with the big dogs, they weren't called Christians. There were actually many sects of Judaism. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes. Um, and it could have been that the Christians were really just considered another sect of Judaism. But here in Antioch, I love Antioch, something distinctive happens. A genuine, uh, new expression of Christianity among Gentiles. And they're so distinctive that they're called Christians. Christians for the first time. And so let's go back to the first set of verses. Acts 13, 1 through 4. And we have these people here. And I'd like to point this out. Um, you know, this past week in New York, the United Nations were meeting to try to, you know, combat world issues. And they get the nations together. And every time they come together, there's, you know, people are walking out and, you know, all these disputes. Look at this. Look at the scenery here in Antioch in the local church. Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius the Cyrenian, Manaean, the foster brother of Herod, and Saul. Okay, I'm going to break this down. Barnabas, um, if you, uh, if you uh, study it, he's actually from Cyprus. Okay, he's from Cyprus. Then you have this uh, brother named Simeon, who was called Niger. And his background was, he is actually from Africa. Uh, African, like, you know, Niger. And so he is... You know, he's African. And then you have Lucius, the Cyrenian. Where Cyrene, Cyrene is right up here. So this is a northern African now. And then you have who? Manaean, who's the foster brother of Herod. Herod was a Roman ruler. So this guy, Manaean, is actually from Europe. He's from Europe. And then you have Saul from Tarsus. And so you have these five believers. All of different backgrounds, different statuses different education. That is the church in Antioch. Isn't that beautiful? I, I look around this room, I'm so glad we have people from all these different backgrounds, different races, different statuses. That is the Lord's new beginning at Antioch. The United Nations may try, but the Church of Christ is a genuine uh, place where all believers, all people can gather, regardless of background. So this is Antioch. So I have this verse here in Colossians 3. Uh, let, let's read these verses. Colossians 3, verses 10 through 11. Ready? Go. And hath put on the new man, which is being renewed unto full knowledge, according to the image of him who created him, where there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all in him all. Brothers and sisters, this should be our characteristic. Christ is all and in all. We don't exalt any race, any ethnicity, any background. Like Kenny said, our, the club's name is Christian Students. I'm glad there are no modifiers before Christian. It's not, I'll use Felipe again, Colombian <laughs> Christian Students. Or, you know, Mikhail, Ukrainian Christian Students. No. Christ is all and in all. Yeah. And this is, this is, I want to impress you, this is how the churches had a new start, a new beginning here in Antioch. And this is the new man. Actually, when I look around, I don't see so many different races. I just see Christ. Yeah. Christ is all and in all. Yeah. This, is, this is Paul part of Paul's vision of the body of Christ. Okay, so now let's go back to the top, Acts 13. What were they doing in Antioch? Okay. And I'm going to kind of unpack these verses. It may not seem that striking, but I, I, I'm just impressed to the other ones. There were in Antioch... Okay, first question. What were Paul and, and this group of four brothers... Where were they? Where were they? It says they were in Antioch in the local church. In the local church. So the first thing you have to see is 
at the commencement of Paul being called to go really serve the Lord, he was active in the local church. You say, wow, that seems kind of obvious. Are you active in the local church? They were there. What were they doing? They were prophets and teachers. Again, I won't read all the names. But they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. So they were already serving the Lord. And I think this is a good topic because I know some of you in this room are at crossroads in your lives where maybe you're nearing graduation and you're wondering, how do I know what the Lord's calling for me is? How do I know the Lord's leading? Does the Lord want me to go here? Does the Lord want me to go there? I'm presenting to you here uh, a picture of how God calls people and how God leads people. And the first thing you have to see is, you're in this environment where you are with fellow believers, fellow brothers and sisters, and you're in the local church. And you're actually active. Okay, they, they're not sitting there passive, but what? They are ministering to the Lord and fasting. So, I almost want to get a group of five brothers, but I, I won't pull you up. But imagine five brothers here. They're in the church, and they're just ministering to the Lord. I know that's a, a mysterious phrase, which I'll come back to. But I want you to get a sense of this picture. In this environment, in this uh, context, something is happening where eventually somebody's future function is manifest. And Paul has a function to be an apostle. But how is it manifested? It starts by being in a local church and being with brothers. Or in the case of sisters, you're being with some sisters. And you're doing something. You're ministering to the Lord. So it doesn't come by sitting, waiting, and dreaming. One day, the phone is going to ring. I'm going to get a call. And it's going to say, Ben, we need you in Russia. You've been waiting your whole life. Uh, you know, now step into the phone booth. You know, change into your Superman and we're going to send you to Russia. We may, we may have this thought that the calling will come in some, some way like that. See this picture here. The calling, actually, the calling to come to serve, it only goes to those who are serving already. There's kind of a contradiction. But it is only in your service that God will call you to service. And it is in that service. Here, prophets and teachers. What is a prophet? A prophet is somebody who just speaks for God. You speak for God. Okay, if you practice to speak for God, then something is manifested. What is a teacher? A teacher is somebody who just helps teach others the Word of God. Maybe you're in a Bible study and you're helping to teach a younger one. That may be your functioning as a teacher. But you're doing things like that and that becomes an opportunity for the Spirit to manifest who you are. Here's another example. I have a, a six-year-old boy. Okay, Ben, you come up here too. Okay. Ben, how old are you? 19? Uh, yeah. Okay. I have a six-year-old boy. I have no idea what he'll be in the future. He has interest in this. You know, he wants to be a soccer player or basketball. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, he, he's like, uh, you know, he, we have no clue, right? All we can do is feed him and um, cause him to grow and be an active, normal kid, right? And over time, he'll grow from six, and then one day maybe he'll be 19, <laughs> like Ben. And Ben, um, you're an engineer, right? Okay, when you were six, did you know you were going to be an engineer? Uh, not quite. Right? But, but, you see, life grows, and he's in the right environment. And now he's here at USC, and he's studying engineering. And we start to see, do you see it? We start to see <laughs> the makings of an engineer. Do you see that? Thank you, Ben. Okay, see, now, now the, uh, the function is being manifested. 
So, I, I don't know about you, but this impresses me to the uttermost. Mm. John, don't sit and dream, right? Amen. Right? Don't, don't say, oh, one day, if God calls me to do this, then, you know, okay, then it'll be so clear. Actually, that calling takes place while you are active with the brothers and sisters. And, and isn't this your experience? Sometimes you're not sure what to do, but you're just enjoying the Lord. You're just touching the Lord. And, and there's so much joy there, then all of a sudden you get clear. You get clear. You know what? You, know, you might have been struggling. I don't know if I should do this or that on the weekend. And then maybe you go to a home meeting and you're just with the brothers and sisters enjoying the Lord. You get home, you're like, wow, I'm clear as to what I need to do. Because that's, that's the environment where the Lord is speaking to you, where you are in the local church. Okay, now what is the activity they're doing? What is the activity? It says they are ministering to the Lord and fasting. It's remarkable what is not mentioned here. They're not busy doing a lot of activity. They're not, I mean, you say, well, you contradict yourself. You just said, be active, be active. No, they're not doing a lot of activity. In a sense, it's a, it's a particular activity. They're not preaching the gospel, actually. I'm sure they were, but that's not the salient thing. Um, they weren't going on trips. They weren't, you know, all of these things. They were actually in a very peaceful way in the presence of the Lord, ministering to Him. And most translations translate this word minister. Some Bibles translate it worshiping. But the main point is here, they were there in the presence of the Lord, enjoying the Lord. As they were ministering to the Lord. And so the, the main point here is that they were enjoying a person. They were enjoying the Lord. The Lord himself was the priority. Let me ask some of the uh, students, right? When you, we encourage you to preach the gospel, but when you come together, you say, we're going to go out to preach the gospel. Okay, you're focused on people. That's good. But do you have the realization? that the primary service, the primary thing that we can do is always to the Lord, for the Lord. We are, what, what is uh, so um, paramount, preeminent, is ministering to the Lord. So they take this person, the Lord, as their priority. And they don't worry about anyone else or anything else. You know, we sang this hymn, remember, and um, I think uh, Kaylee or Elizabeth, they shared on stanza two. If you turn, turn the page, actually, to the hymn, and we have this stanza two, which says, Like Mary, I sit at his feet. Like John, I recline on his breast. His presence is fullness of joy. His bosom is infinite rest. You know, this song we were singing, in a sense, it's about working, Right? We'll work with the king. I'll serve. But the whole feeling of that song, do you feel like it's a lot of sweating? A lot of rolling up the sleeves? Actually, the feeling of that song is what? Delight. Rest. Dwelling. Dwelling. Um, I forget who Felipe said that or somebody. Um, Joseph, yeah. I'm dwelling with Jesus. This is the kind of activity, actually, that the Lord delights in, where you're really close to the Lord. And so I want to, it's not on your verses, but I want to read Luke chapter 10. You could write this down, write this down in your, um, how about Elizabeth and Morong? Can you come up here? I, 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 I want to I you to see this. Okay, this is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, okay? This is a picture of serving the Lord. Now as they went, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her home. Okay, pretend I'm, I'm the Lord, and I'm going to your home. This is Mary and Martha. Okay, Martha. Moran here, Martha. Okay. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. Okay, sorry. Do you mind sitting? <laughs> okay, actually, not, not, not you, Morong. Not you. Mary. Look at Mary. 
Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet, right? <laughs> Listening to my word. She was just <laughs> enjoying my presence. Wow, Lord, you're here. I just like to be in your presence. Okay, what about Moran? Martha was being drawn about with much serving. Oh. You're, 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 and actually, this, in the Greek, it means like distracted and going in all sorts of directions. So you kind of, like I said, you're kind of going in all, you're, you're, you're getting the food, you're cleaning the bathroom, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're busy, right? With much serving. And look at, look at, look at, look at uh, Mary, just sitting on my feet. Okay, so Martha comes, Martha comes to me and says, Lord, does it not matter? Actually, you should, you should read this. You read verse 40. You read verse 40. Okay, read them loudly. This is Martha. Lord, it does not matter that my sister has left me to serve alone. Tell her then to do her part with me. Right, you see that? Martha's complaining. <laughs> I'm doing so much. And Mary's just sitting at your feet. She's not doing anything. You know, help, help me. Have her help me. But the Lord answered and said, Martha, Martha, <laughs> you are anxious and troubled about many things. Many things. But there is need of one thing. And your sister, Mary, has chosen the better part. Okay, thank you very much, sister. This is, this is what the Lord would, like, would delight in. To have this kind of attentiveness. This kind of ministering to the Lord. For you are really in His presence and really enjoying the Lord. I love that we are out preaching the gospel. That we have Bible studies. All these things. But we need this kind of hidden activity where we are fully occupied with ministering to the Lord. I have these verses here. As the, the last set of verses, Luke 17. This is kind of a funny, you might think, wow, this is an odd way to close the sheet. But let's read these verses in Luke 17 all together. Ready? Go. But which of you, having a slave who is following or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, I said at the beginning, I hope this fellowship kind of breaks some of your concepts. And th these verses here should help. If, if, if your concepts are a little broken, then I hope these verses will smash them. <laughs> like, like angry birds, right? <laughs> I want the, the whole thing demolished. Um, because this is the Lord speaking here about service. And he says, okay, you have a slave. Plowing or tending sheep. Okay, what's what's plowing? Plowing is like um, your. Uh, actually, I'm not a farmer. What's plowing? <laughs> Nobody knows. Yeah, it's, it's, it's when you have a, a cattle. Right. You're like kind of. Um, you're, yeah. you're 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 plowing the seed, right? Yeah. You're making the way. For you're the making seed. the way. You're okay. It's it's like right. That's like what preaching the gospel. You're 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 you're, you're spreading the seed, causing the growth. Okay. Isn't that, that's a good service, right? A slave can do that. Okay, another slave is, or, or tending sheep. What's tending sheep? Isn't that caring for the younger ones? Aren't there sheep we need to care for? Okay, in our view, that is the main service. Okay, some of you, you know, you're thinking, in my future, should I be a plower or should I be a sheep tender? Lord, what should I do? Should I go and travel and preach the gospel or should I just be in a church and shepherd the young people and the children. What should I do? What should I do? This is, this is the slaves. I, I'm doing all this stuff outwardly, visibly. People see this. But when he has come in from the field, what does the master say? Does the master say, oh, come <laughs> immediately, recline that table. Good job. Great job, Kevin. Great job. Excellent. Take a break. This is what, this is what our master says. Prepare something that I may die. And gird yourself and serve me. Serve me until I eat and drink. After that, you will eat and drink. This is, this is, this is my burden that all of you, your college students, 
Nobody here is traveling around, running around the world, doing all these things. But now, we can be in an environment where we're being built with brothers, being built with sisters. And we can be ministering to the Lord. We can know the Lord in a very personal way. And in this environment, the day will come where the Lord makes clear where we should be, what we should be doing, and how we should be serving Him. And then we can be those who genuinely sing that hymn uh, with the deepest of experience. Let's sing stanza five all together, actually. And then I'll, we'll conclude. We can just, uh, we'll just start. Well, who can start for us? You don't want me to. We'll dwell with the King for His work and work through each day of the year. Perhaps ere it passes, the King in glory Himself shall appear. a little group discussion, maybe just take two minutes and just uh, with your groups to share anything you may have enjoyed or anything that stood out to you.